ETF Prime is hosted by investment advisors of the ETF Store. This program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. The ETF Store is not affiliated with ETF.com or any of its affiliates. ETF.com's participation in this program should not be construed as an endorsement or an indication by ETF.com of the value of any ETF Store product or service. Visit ETFStore.com for more information. Now it's time for ETF Prime, where we discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of ETF Prime, Nate Geraci. Welcome to ETF Prime, Nate Geraci alongside Connor Kelly. As always, thank you so much for joining us. We have a tremendous show lined up today. We're going to start with ETF.com's Dave Nottig. We'll look at several new ETFs that have launched over the past couple of months, including ETFs from both Vanguard and Cambria. And we're also going to touch on a new eSports ETF that came out last week from VanEck. We've actually had about... 200 new ETF launches so far this year, so the creativity certainly isn't slowing down. We'll then be joined by Tadas Visconta, Director of Investor Education at Ritholtz Wealth Management. He's also founder of the very popular financial content curation website, Abnormal Returns. So for over 13 years now, Tadas has been curating the best investment blogs, articles, podcasts, Literally every single day, Ritholtz's Josh Brown calls Tadas the best curator of financial news and opinions in the world. And then you add to that, Tadas has over 25 years of experience in the financial markets. He really brings a unique perspective on investing and investor behavior. So we're going to visit with Tadas about what he's learned over his years of curating financial content. And then we'll throw some rapid fire questions his way on both investing and ETF. Should be a fun conversation. We'll close the show today with Ted Lucas, Head of Investment Strategies and Solutions for Hartford Funds. He's going to spotlight the largest Hartford ETF, the Hartford Multi-Factor Developed Markets XUS ETF. And we'll also hear his thoughts on international stocks moving forward. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit ETFprime.com or you can find us on Twitter at Nate Geraci and at C. Kelly 1980. Let's chat with ETF.com's Dave Nottig. Time now for our weekly chat with the experts at ETF.com, the world's leading independent authority on ETFs. People have been saying there are too many mutual funds since the 80s. For all the talk of smart beta, they haven't pulled in huge assets. The active managers are showing up in the ETF space. All right, Dave. So last week I was looking through the list of new ETFs. And just over the past couple of months, there's been some pretty interesting launches, a handful of which we'll cover today. But as I understand it, you're a pretty big gamer video gamer. <laughs> so I thought we had to start with a Van Eck Vectors video gaming and esports ETF, ticker symbol ESPO. This just rolled out last week. And I saw you had a few comments on this during your ETF.com live chat last week. So what's your take here? Do you think this fills a niche? Well, sure. I mean, it's a niche that there's already one uh, ETF in, which is Gamer, G-A-M-R, uh, which, you know, is, is I think, a, a perfectly fine attempt at this space as well. Um, you know, that's the, the ETFMG video game tech ETF. That one tends to lead a little bit more into hardware. Uh, ESPO, the new fund from Van Eck, uh, distinguishes itself in a couple ways. It's really focused on the companies that are uh, in the business of profiting from not just esports but broad gaming. Uh, so it tends to be less of a, a sort of an equal weighted hardware type play and a little bit more focused on companies right in the middle of it like Tencent Holdings, Nintendo, Activision, Electronic Arts, the companies we all think of as game companies. Obviously, we're not into making any sort of investment calls on this show, but just from the perspective of someone who at least knows a thing or two about this space, do you see a longer-term investment opportunity around esports? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it is legitimately a economic phenomenon, um, more so outside of the United States than in the United States. In, in markets like South Korea, mainland China, esports is huge, huge, multi-million dollar businesses. Uh, in, in, in all sorts of areas, from companies that are doing uh, the marketing of these events and actually holding physical in-person events to the actual companies making the games and promoting them as esports. So I think it's a, it's a legitimate place to be thinking about investment. I think the challenge is, like many thematic ETFs, Getting a pure play can be really challenging. Well, and I wonder, too, uh, you know, last week I saw Bloomberg's Eric Balchunas made a good point on Twitter. He basically said video games are perceived as a toy by investors and not necessarily as a serious theme like robotics and cybersecurity. I, I think his point being, will advisors be hesitant to have clients open up their statements and, and see a video game fund? Do you think there's anything to that at all? Oh, I think absolutely. I think the same way uh, advisors might be, you know, reluctant to put in any narrow niche fund. Like, I mean, you could say the same thing about the marijuana ETF, MJ, which we've talked about plenty of times. You can certainly say that about something like Bitcoin or even, you know, restaurants. I mean, pick pick a small, narrow theme, and you as an advisor or an investor really need to understand why you're chasing that theme, why you think that's going to drive returns. If you're not convinced and you don't think you can talk to your clients about it, you probably have no business being in it. All right. Another recent ETF launch is the Cambria Trinity Fund, ticker symbol TRTY. So this actually owns other ETFs, primarily Cambria ETFs. And notably, it has a zero management fee, though obviously the fees from the underlying ETFs flow through. But I put this on our list today because I saw during that same ETF.com live chat you did last week, you mentioned this ETF intrigued you, which then caught my attention. So what do you like about this one? Well, you know, I think a lot of times we get the question, I'm sure you get it too, Nate, like at a cocktail party or a relative calls you and says, can't I just buy the one thing? Uh, and this is a fund that is designed to be the answer to that question. Now, one size doesn't always fit all, but what this fund does is it takes – Cambria's very successful Trinity ETF allocation model. They run six model portfolios that invest in, you know, 20 ish ETFs for different levels of risk tolerance, for different levels of income demand. This sort of takes the middle of the road Trinity portfolio, uh, to use their term for it, uh, sort of a moderate risk portfolio with a little bit of trend following juice in it. And it bakes that into a no-fee ETF. So the the underlying expense ratio here of all the funds ends up being about 65 basis points, which is the same as if you went to Cambria and just gave them your money as an advisor and they put you in one of these portfolios, uh, but you're not paying a, a separate fee to that advisor. So if this is the right match for your risk tolerance and your sort of desire for income and capital appreciation, I love the fact that we're seeing some one-stop shop approaches here, uh, baking in, you know, a, a very well-respected ETF strategy approach. Well, no doubt. I think if you look at Cambria's lineup, Med Faber over there, they have several very intelligently designed ETFs focusing on shareholder yield, value. You mentioned trend following or momentum. So certainly interesting underlying ETFs. I, I guess similar question to what I asked with uh, the esports ETF. You, you know, while you and I know that an approach like this can certainly win the long game for investors, the two concerns I see just in terms of it gathering assets are, one, I think investment advisors, for better or worse, on any of these asset allocation ETFs, not just Cambria's, I don't think most of them want their clients receiving a statement with just one ETF on it, <laughs> right? And then the other issue is from an individual investor standpoint, which is similar, I just wonder about their ability to log into their E-Trade account, see one ETF holding that as we know, is going to have some periods of underperformance. And, you know, can they stick with it? I, do you see those as concerns at all? Sure. And I think that I, it's very unlikely that this fund get, generates billions of dollars of assets from financial advisors. That's not what this is targeted for. This is targeted for that person who is asking the question, can I just have a single, you know, one-stop shop approach here? I mean, remember, in the in retirement space, Target date funds rule the roost, and those are effectively a similar approach. This is a target risk fund in that it's really targeted at sort of a mid-tier mid, mid -tier risk 
trend-following strategy. Um, of course, it will always underperform whatever the best-performing asset class is in any, different, any given quarter because it has treasuries in it. It has bonds in it. It has international exposure. Um, so you, you would not expect it to beat whatever this quarter's great asset class is. But I think for a lot of investors, this would be a smart solution. I think there will be a class of individual investors for whom this makes a ton of sense. Well, and as you mentioned, it is targeting a moderate risk profile. So I'm assuming if it does have some success, we'll, we'll probably see additional versions targeting other risk profiles. All right, two other new ETFs I wanted to ask you about were the Vesper U.S. Large Cap Short-Term Reversal Strategy ETF, ticker symbol UTRN, U-Turn, great ticker symbol, and then the Vanguard Total World Bond ETF, BNDW. Let's take U-Turn first. And I, I should note, actually, on November 6th, we'll be joined by Dr. Victor Chow. He developed the methodology behind this ETF. Any initial thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm familiar with Dr. Chow's work. He's been writing about ETFs and stock returns in particular for quite some time. Um, so he's sort of a known academic finance guy coming in here. And the strategy here is it's sort of delightfully simple in a sense. It is just pure contrarian. You take the thing everybody beat up on last week and you buy it. Right, and then you hold it for a week, and you see if it's still the one people beat up on. If it is, you keep it, and if it had a reversal, and it hence the name U turn here, uh, then you you know take your profits and you take them and invest them in something else. So it's going to be a very very high turnover strategy. Um, now the math here actually works on sort of a month to month basis. The only year in the last decade that this strategy really hasn't paid off has been uh, 2015, where it underperformed the S and P by a couple percent. But month after month, this actually tends to do pretty well. But, you know, it requires some, some significant uh, intestinal fortitude to hold on to this because you're literally going to be churning this whole portfolio, por- whole portfolio almost every week, and you're going to be investing in the stocks that are in the headlines and not in a good way, right? <laughs> so you've got to really have that contrarian bloodline to be able to put up with a fund like this. Well, and along with that, obviously, if you have a lot of turnover, that means transaction costs, which obviously yeah. the fund will have to overcome as well. All right, what about the what, what about the Vanguard Total World Bond ETF, which is just a wrapper on BND and uh, BNDX? Good idea here. Well, you know, I, I after saying so many nice things about Trinity rolling up seventeen different ETFs, <laughs> I'm going to turn myself around here and say this might be a little too simple, right? This is really just doing an allocation between two Vanguard ETFs. Uh, you know, I think that is, you know, useful in the sense that it may give you a guidepost for what your exposure should be. Just, you know, it just takes the U.S. and the international market and close to 50-50 weights them uh, based on their market cap. I think it's a little bit more on the international side. Um, I love the underlying funds here. I, it's hard to beat the two underlying funds that you're investing in. I'm not sure you need another fund to wrap those two positions for you. So I think it might just be a little too simplistic. The one thing that I do like about it is many investors are vastly underweight international bonds. And so if this can just bring some visibility to that, make it easier, obviously you can do it through BNDX, but if this is a one-stop shop and gets an investor exposure to international bonds, I do think that's a win. Uh, Dave, always fun chatting. Uh, Look forward to talking again next week. Thanks for having me. That was ETF.com's Dave Nottig. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Tadas Visconta, Director of Investor Education at Ritholtz Wealth Management and founder of the blog Abnormal Returns. We're going to cover a whole range of topics with Tadas. We'll find out what he's learned about investing over his years of curating financial content. We'll talk investor behavior, and we'll touch on uh, ETFs as well. We'll do that right after the break. You're listening to ETF Prime. Welcome back to ETF Prime, Nature AC alongside Connor Kelly. Our next guest is Tadas Visconta, Director of Investor Education at Ritholtz Wealth Management and founder of the popular blog Abnormal Returns, which is essentially a one-stop shop for all of the best investment content. So Tadas curates blogs, articles, podcasts, literally every single day. 
Tadas also has over 25 years of experience in the financial markets. He's written a book on what he's learned from curating financial content. He's simply an excellent all-around resource on investing. Tadas is joining us via phone today from just outside of Indianapolis. Tadas, great having you back on the show. It's been a while. Nate, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me back. Well, first, uh, congratulations. I know your blog recently celebrated its 13th anniversary. You're sort of the godfather of the financial blogosphere. There's a lot I want to cover today, but first, for people who aren't familiar with abnormal returns, can you just give us a quick snapshot on the type of content you post and perhaps how you got involved with this to begin with? Well, sure. I I appreciate that, and I appreciate you highlighting uh, 13 years, like I, I like to say that uh, the blog has just become a teenager. So uh, <laughs> I think part of, part of uh, whatever success I might have had is really just a function of hanging around. Uh, but really, it's, the blog is really a uh, uh, an outlet for me to express my interest in the financial markets and things that I have found interesting. And it's and one of the things that one of the interesting trends that has come about is that. The growth of ETF during the 13 years from when I started the blog back in 2005 until today has been, you know, quite remarkable. And I think, you know, uh, uh, tracking the trajectory of the ETF industry has been, you know, a big part of what I have seen over this time period. Have you seen that firsthand in the type of content that you are curating where you have more ETF related content and you've seen sort of that uh, that that growth trajectory uh, over the past 13 years? Oh, yeah, absolutely. When I started out, you know, a new ETF launch was big news. And so today you have, uh, you know, today, as you very well know, you might have multiple ETF launches on on any single day. And it's frankly become, you know, it's really not uh, unless you are a professional, uh, you know, whose job it is to uh, track the ETF industry. It really is difficult to stay up to date. And so, uh, you know, that has really been a big change in uh, the way that I have viewed the financial markets. And so it's not just the content, but I think the ET- ETFs have really fundamentally changed uh, the industry in a number of interesting and different ways. If we look at a broader level, I'm curious, how has your own investment philosophy changed over the years? You, you know, as you read and listen to knowledge experts from all across the investment universe on a daily basis, how has that impacted you personally? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I first started the blog, I was really, in my mind, I was writing for a DIY investor. So, so that was somebody, an individual investor who was looking for inf- information about the market and who was trying to put together their own investment strategy and investment portfolio, and which I think is still very much, you know, a, uh, a viable sort of solution. I guess the thing that I've come to over time is that I have recognized that that is, um, you know, I think that's a small minority of investors. And I, I come to that uh, conclusion really kind of as a part of, you know, as, as Nate, as, very, as you very well know, behavioral investing and behavioral finance, the research on these topics has kind of exploded over the past 10 to 20 years. And it really shows, um, I think the bottom line from that research is that it shows that it's difficult for any of us, all of us have a whole raft of biases and behaviors that are difficult, that make it difficult for us to manage our investments on our own. And I think I've kind of come to the conclusion that for the vast majority of investors, having some assistance in putting a portfolio together, monitoring it, and revisiting it for, you know, on a periodic basis, I think having some other solution, I think is quite valuable to investors. And so I've kind of I've kind of come. I don't know if I've come 100. I don't know if I've come 180 degrees on that, but I have certainly shifted my position on that topic. So let's talk more about this. I think this is a really interesting area when, when we talk about investor behavior. Obviously, a goal of, of abnormal returns is to sort of cut through all of the noise that's out there. You really try to curate content that's relevant and meaningful to investors. But what's your view of the overall financial media landscape right now? Because it seems like. Everyone and their brother now has a podcast, right? Everyone has a blog. Everyone's on Twitter. Of course, we know the major financial media, the CNBCs and Bloombergs of the world. We know what they do. So outside of going to a place like Abnormal Returns, how can investors manage this just ridiculous flow of information? How can they drink off the fire hose? 
No, I, I absolutely agree that it is a fire hose. And from my perspective, you know, I am all for letting a thousand flowers bloom. I, you know, I very, I very much want uh, individuals, whether they be professionals, amateurs, or the financial media to put out content, hopefully good content. But I think, you know, I, I have described it as kind of an imperfect meritocracy. I think over time, uh, the kind of the cream rise, the, the cream sort of rises to the top. And, you know, it's not perfect. There are certainly, there are certainly parts of the financial media and part of the blogosphere that are very much uh, interested only in clicks and, you know, hot headlines and, and generating uh, you know, generating um, interest in that regard. So, you know, it's not perfect. And so, I, you know, I, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for individuals when it comes to, to looking to the media. I think the one kind of lens to really think about is, you know, when you're reading something, to what degree is, is what you're reading going to be interesting or relevant three, three months, six months, or a year from now? And a lot of what you're reading is really just sort of ephemera. You know, people trying to explain the latest market move based upon, uh, you know, political headlines or things like that. And you realize that, you know, a year from now, you're going to have completely forgotten uh, whatever, whatever it is that article was talking about. Whereas when you're thinking about, you know, when you're reading something that's really talking about strategy or behavior or things like that, that's something that has the more likely to have relevance, uh, you know, down the road. Well, I'm not sure if you saw yesterday, the Wall Street Journal had a piece where they talked about the proliferation of social media and, and sort of this 24-7 news cycle. And they were discussing whether or not that's been beneficial or detrimental to investors. But they, they had a good point, which was, if you think back 20 years ago, investors didn't have enough information, right? It was hard to get information. And now that information is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. I do think net-net, that's a good thing uh, for investors. Our guest is Tadas Viscana, Director of Investor Education at Ritholtz Wealth Management and founder of the investment blog, Abnormal Returns. All right, Tadas, so with the uh, remaining time we have, I thought it might be fun to throw some rapid fire questions at you. So I have several uh, questions we can just burn through here if that works okay. Let it rip. All right, so first, if you could only offer one tip to investors, what would it be? Do less. <laughs> Easy enough. Uh, what do you think is the single biggest mistake an investor can make? You know, I think the biggest single mistake investors can make is undertaking an investment strategy that they can't adhere to over time. And so, uh, you know, in that regard, I think that investors sh you know, eventually should find a strategy that they can stick to. And for some people, that might be a portfolio of laddered CDs. And for other people, that might be 100% in equities. And, you know, most of the people are somewhere in between there. But finding a strategy that you can adhere to over time is, I think, the key to success. Yeah. And we talk about that all the time. You know, you have this this old, tired, active versus passive debate. We've seen the, the proliferation of smart beta strategies. You know, at the end of the day, it's it's what can an investor stick to. Right. So if you're, if you're in an index based fund, you have to know that you're going to track the market. If you're in a smart beta fund, there may be some you know, significant tracking or if it's a if pure factor exposure, for example, or active, you're going to have periods of underperformance. I definitely think that gets lost in the shuffle. What, what do you think is the biggest investment myth out there? Something that keeps getting repeated. Maybe it's always out in the media, but you don't think it holds much water. Wow, that's a, you know that's a that's a good one. I, I feel like there's so many of them. You know, I think the biggest one is that somehow I think that a lot of investors think that there is some other some force out there that is having some uh, effect on the market, whether it be government, central banks, or some unnamed sort of third party that is somehow uh, affecting the markets for better or worse. And I think. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the markets are a function of thousands and millions of decisions each day. And I think thinking that there's some sort of uh, somebody pushing your finger on a button that's somehow uh, uh, moving markets around, you know, according to their desires or will, I think is uh, a big myth. All right. So now I'm going to toss a few ETF related questions at you. And as I'm sure you're aware, over the summer, we saw Fidelity offer the first free index mutual funds. 
And that's probably an entirely separate conversation <laughs> regarding what you think about that. But do you think we'll see a zero fee ETF anytime soon? And does it even matter at this point? Uh, I think we will see a zero fee ETF. And I think that it probably doesn't matter. I think I think you've already noted that this, you know, that is really just a culmination of a long trend, uh, a multi-decade sort of trend. And I think if you look at, uh, I think a different way of looking at it is that there are some ETFs, as you very well know, that um, their net fee is actually negative at this point once you take into account the revenues from securities lending. So, uh, you know, and you could argue that we're already there in a certain regard. If you had to put money on it, any uh, guesses to who the first uh, zero fee ETF provider might be? Oh, I don't I don't have any specific guesses. But, you know, other than I think that was that it will happen at some point. All right. So on this topic of ETF cost, do you think investors have become uh, too focused on cost and or maybe not paying enough attention to what an ETF actually owns? Yeah, no, I think costs matter when you are comparing apples to apples. I think costs very much matter. And I think that is a certainly a viable consideration to take into account when comparing like funds. And, you know, all the research, uh, you know, from Morningstar shows that, you know, uh, over time, fees have the biggest impact on relative returns. But I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we kind of talk, we touched upon it earlier uh, where when we were talking about the, the value of education and knowing what, in fact, that you what you own. And that becomes all the more important as the proliferation of ETFs and different types of ETF strategies come to market. And we'll see that continue as, you know, more active strategies uh, get wrapped into the ETF structure. And so uh, I think, you know, it's uh, I think the challenge is making sure that you're comparing like fund to like fund. Todd, us, it's Connor Kelly. <clears throat> Vanguard has been one of the best, I, I would say, companies in frankly, investing history for the average consumer, right, and driving down fees, proliferation of, of index investing, et cetera. We are huge fans of Vanguard and most of their offerings. But with the fund flows occurring, not only in the ETF space, but but broadly in the investment world, at a certain point, do, do the Vanguards and BlackRocks become too large? Is that is that going to be an issue down the road, do you think? I, you know, I, I don't think we're at that point. I mean, I think that there are, when we're talking, you know, we've talked a lot about cost, and I think there is for, uh, you know, a lot of these strategies, when we're talking about broad index funds, there are uh, benefits to size. And I think, you know, I think we've already seen uh, a lot of that, you know, a lot of that happening. And I think, you know, the one interesting thing about Vanguard is, you know, their unique ownership structure really it, you know, is certainly put is transparent in regards to whether we really what it really costs to run some of these funds, and so Vanguard has been effective in driving down you know overall costs for investors. And I would agree with you 100 percent that they have been uh, net net a huge positive for uh, for investors. But you know, I think you know, I think we're still I think we're still going to learn about that, and I think. Size is going to, I think, will start becoming more of an issue when it comes to uh, on the on the side of like governance. When BlackRock and Vanguard have uh, significant voting stakes in different companies and have the ability to throw their weight behind different sorts of proposals or you know uh, votes on boards of directors, things like that, I think that's when size might become. Uh, not just an economic issue, but might become more of a kind of a corporate governance or political issue. Tadas, I, I asked you earlier what was the biggest investment myth out there. What do you think is the biggest ETF myth out there? Oh, you know, I think we're, you know, I think the biggest myth, and I think this is one that's kind of, this is the one that ETFs were originally um, were kind of synonymous with index funds. And I think, and for a long time, and I think for good, I think ETFs were kind of a prime driver of driving the popularity of indexing to the forefront. But I think that's no longer the case. And I think, you know, almost all of the, you know, all of the funds that you are seeing launched today are in some form are either smart beta, uh, actively managed, or some form of uh, strategic sort of allocation funds that really aren't by no means are index funds. And so 
Uh, I think we have to disengage the idea that ETFs are synonymous with index funds anymore. Bitcoin ETF, good or bad idea? You know, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I, I taught a class, uh, I taught a college class on investing, and Bitcoin was a, was a really hot topic with, uh, you know, so those sorts of Gen Y and millennial sorts of investors. Um, and I thought, frankly, I thought that the Bitcoin uh, futures were going to be the road by which uh, Bitcoin was going to become uh, become a publicly traded ETF. And so I'm kind of surprised that that wasn't the route that has been taken. But I would kind of throw Bitcoin into the same bucket as a lot of the leveraged and inverse funds that are likely not really for public consumption in the sense that you really have to be a sophisticated investor to really understand the risks that you're taking and all of that. And so I think for the broader public, the Bitcoin ETF is probably uh, a not so hot idea. But, uh, you know, but I think uh, I certainly, you know, I certainly wouldn't oppose it. Uh, it's uh, coming to market if there were the proper, uh, if all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed and there was some uh, some sense that the custody issues would be uh, uh, not be a, not be a problem down the road. All right. So last question for you. The entire Ritholtz crew, so Josh Brown, Barry Ritholtz, Ben Carlson, Michael Batnick, there are some others. All of them are excellent bloggers. But I'm going to put you on the spot today. So if you could only pick one, who's your favorite blogger out of the bunch? <laughs> Oh well, that's like trying to pick my favorite child. Uh, I don't. I don't know that I could do that, you know. Uh, but I think you, you know, I'll, I'll plug. I'll plug myself. If you want to, if you want to read the best of what they're writing, you come to Abnormal Returns, and then you'll get the you'll get the whole smorgasbord. That is so. a fantastic answer. Good answer. <laughs> Tadas, we'll have to leave it there. Great having you back on the show. Always fun to chat. Thank you for joining us today. Nate Connor, thanks. I appreciate it. That was Tadas Visconti, Director of Investor Education at Ritholtz Wealth Management and founder of Abnormal Returns. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Ted Lucas, Head of Investment Strategies and Solutions at Hartford Funds. We'll spotlight one of their multi-factor ETFs. This is ETF Prime. Welcome back to ETF Prime, Nate and Connor in studio. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week we highlight one exchange-traded fund. There are thousands of ETFs available to invest in. ETF Prime has sorted through them all, so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Hartford Multi-Factor Developed Markets XUS ETF, ticker symbol RODM, Hartford currently offers 11 ETFs overall. Those ETFs have about $1.5 billion invested in them, led by RODM. And we're now very pleased to be joined by Ted Lucas, Head of Investment Strategies and Solutions for Hartford Funds. Ted is on the line with us from San Francisco. Ted, a pleasure having you on the program today. Thank you, Nate. Great to be with you. Ted, so RODM offers exposure to developed international stocks, it targets three factors, value, momentum, and quality. Take us from there. What's the overall goal of this ETF? And walk us through the underlying construction. Sure, Nate. So the strategy, uh, as you said, covers developed markets outside of the U.S. So there's 22 markets that are covered. And uh, the way we've constructed the strategy really focuses on two elements. One is how can you potentially enhance returns over the market cycle and at the same time reduce risk? So really, we think about this in both offensive and defensive terms. So as you mentioned, we, we do target forming a portfolio that has improved valuation relative to the universe that we're investing in, but at the same time has higher quality, so higher degree of profitability, higher return on equity, less leverage, uh, and then also has positive momentum. So we're, we see investor enthusiasm building up behind the stock. So that's kind of the offensive side of things. And, and the belief there is, hey, if we can invest, again, in a portfolio that offers these improved characteristics, there's an opportunity to enhance returns. Secondly, but no less importantly, we focus on defensive qualities of the portfolio. And there what we're trying to do is significantly diversify uh, both at the stock level, at the country level, and at the currency level. 
uh, as well as at the sector level. So if we think about that, we, we also then try to target a 15 to 20% reduction in realized volatility and downside participation uh, during more turbulent parts of the market. And we think that's a unique feature uh, of the strategy in the sense that uh, investors looking to diversify outside of the U.S. Uh, do have to take on currency risk, and that often can contribute additional volatility and inflates the quality. Typically, uh, the U.S. dollar appreciates against other currencies, so you might have greater downside participation. And we believe that this, this targeted 15 to 20 percent uh, risk reduction that's built into the strategy can allow investors to access international markets, uh, but at a risk level that's more consistent with what they might see in the U.S., and obviously, uh, overall, we're trying to deliver this in a highly cost and tax efficient package, the ETF. So, Ted, if an investor is comparing RODM to a market cap weighted developed international ETF, if we just boil this down, what are some of the major differences they're going to see as they look under the hood? Um, you're going to see uh, greater diversification, certainly at the stock level. So you're, you're going to see less concentration uh, in whether it's the largest 10 positions or even across the whole portfolio. Uh, again, you're going to see if you were to line up valuation characteristics, you're going to see a portfolio that is cheaper than the market, that has higher uh, quality in some of the different characteristics I mentioned before, and where you have higher momentum. And then again, in realized return space, you're going to see a different risk return profile with respect to generally more defensive characteristics during more turbulent periods for the market. On that last point, obviously there are a number of ETFs that simply target the low volatility factor. Actually, I believe Hartford now offers a couple of these. But what's the benefit of taking a multi-factor approach to lowering volatility over just targeting the low vol factor by itself? Yeah, I think there are a variety of approaches in the market, and uh, generally uh, some of the critiques that have been leveled at them uh, run across sort of three dimensions. One is uh, you can often engender significant concentration at the sector level, so more defensive sectors like utilities, telecom, consumer staples. If it's an international strategy, there can also be greater country concentration. Uh, the second issue is uh, targeting low volatility without controlling for other factors um, can result uh, at different points in time in having negative exposure. So uh, going back maybe a year, year and a half ago, uh, low volatility stocks were actually trading at a premium to the market. So they had negative exposure to value. So to, to that extent, uh, you may uh, actually be uh, forming sort of anti-factor uh, exposure across other dimensions. And then finally, uh, targeting low volatility stocks does not necessarily guarantee that the portfolio will be low volatility. So I think... Uh, a multi-factor approach that, number one, uh, seeks to improve diversification against traditional low-vol strategies uh, can certainly be uh, perhaps more additive to investors' portfolio, as well as ensuring that you have positive exposure to some of these other rewarded factors. And then finally, where you have a more targeted objective of risk reduction as opposed to just depending on a portfolio of low-volatility stocks to deliver some level of risk reduction that's unknown uh, in advance of the actual experience. Our guest is Ted Lucas, Head of Investment Strategies and Solutions for Hartford Funds. We're spotlighting the Hartford Multi-Factor Developed Markets XUS ETF, ticker symbol RODM. Ted, do you think a strategy like this can help investors behaviorally? We've actually talked quite a bit about investor behavior on our program today, but, but maybe just making it easier to stay in the market during a downturn or periods of volatility? I, I do, and, and that actually is uh, something that makes me hopeful because we certainly can recognize that uh, investor behavior through dollar-weighted returns, uh, there's a persistent pattern where we tend as investors to buy high and sell low. And I think with multi-factor investing in the ETF package, uh, there are three things you can think about. One is, first of all, uh, aligning beliefs and principles that you may have as an investor with the actual strategy. So to the extent that an investor believes that all things being equal over time, a portfolio that has higher quality in the market at an improved valuation um, with, uh, with investor enthusiasm, with positive momentum, if that set of, of underlying securities uh, in a package where there's greater diversification in the market and targeted risk reduction, if that makes sense, um, I think the strategy can be put in the portfolio aligned with those beliefs. 
And then secondly, obviously, uh, with a strategy that's systematic and based on a, a rules-based index, the investor can be assured that those portfolio characteristics will be repeated over and over and over. It doesn't guarantee that the strategy will perform uh, well over every sort of short-term window, but you can be guaranteed that you'll get those characteristics. And then finally, with the, the transparency of the ETF form, you've got holdings and weights uh, on a real-time basis you can sort of trust but verify, which is to say the investor can continually look into the portfolio to ensure that those characteristics, that those beliefs that they have are actually expressed in the portfolio. I do believe that can give investors greater confidence to hold the strategy. They understand what they own. Uh, they understand they're getting what they think they want to get, and they can continually verify that. Ted, just playing a bit of devil's advocate, one of the concerns I've had with factor-based strategies is that investors might not be able to stick with them through the inevitable periods of underperformance. Do you think we just need more education out there on these types of strategies? Or, you know, is behavior always going to be an issue, which I guess is why some of these factors work to begin with? Yeah, I, I think uh, one of the... Uh one of the virtues of, of a multi-factor approach versus just targeting a single factor is we know that factors come in and out of favor. So value is a good example. It's worked certainly over uh, long periods of time in the market to produce substantially a substantial excess return, but there can be periods where there's significant underperformance. We've just undergone one of those. So to the extent that in that case you can complement value by having positive exposure to other factors that are working, things like momentum, things like quality, uh, you can actually prevent some of this very significant divergence against cap weighted. And I think, again, investors, while they may not uh, experience the very best performance they had picked with hindsight, the best performing single factor over a certain period you get a more persistent experience in terms of uh, return improvement and risk reduction through the multi-factor approach. Ted, this is Connor Kelly. Just to follow up on that point, you know, international markets had a phenomenal 17 and a good start to this year, but really since March, April have really kind of broken down. Just talk through high level how this ETF has performed compared to broad uh, market cap international exposure. Uh, the ETF launched about three and a half years ago and um, has provided a, a meaningful return enhancement over that period, so to the tune of uh, several hundred basis points and annualized excess return. Um, a lot of that, not, not only has the factor enhancement contributed to that, but a lot of that has come from the improved downside capture during negative periods. And, and we all know that the math of investing 50% loss does not require a 50% gain to get back to even. It's 100%. So to the extent that you can uh, add value by uh, improving downside capture, that really does uh, improve long-term compounding. Uh, and the strategy has done quite well against its peer group. We, uh, with a three-year track record um, going back to February of this year, uh, Morningstar uh, rates the strategy, obviously, and, and uh, it has been top decile against its peer group and, and did receive five, five stars from Morningstar. Ted, RODM obviously focuses on international stocks, but Hartford offers both U.S. and emerging market versions of effectively the same multi-factor strategy as well. Is that correct? That is correct, and we're targeting the same factors. Um, the consistent thing to think about, and perhaps it's even more acute in the U.S. and in emerging markets, is diversification. So with emerging markets, clearly uh, while you have two dozen markets or so that, that are liquid that you can invest in, um, the largest markets, China, South Korea, Taiwan, um, account for upwards of two-thirds of the capital allocation. And there's very significant individual position concentration. Companies like Tencent, although not as concentrated as it was at the beginning of the year, but Tencent, Alibaba, you had a lot of positions that were close to 4 or 5% market cap portfolio. So we seek to reduce concentration at both the country level, at the, at the stock level. And then in the U.S., similarly, we're targeting the same factors, uh, but you'll see less concentration in some of the large tech names uh, that obviously have run very hard and, and more recently come under pressure. Hey, Ted, we have a few minutes left here. I, I'm curious, Hartford ha uh, has a very rich heritage of traditional active management. So why not go that route through your ETFs instead of using the systematic index-based approach like, like you're using with the multi-factor ETFs? 
Yeah, Hartford Funds has a great lineup. We've been part of Hartford Funds for a little over two years now. Uh, the firm I founded, Lattice, was acquired by Hartford Funds. And one of the, the attractions was uh, what we saw as a very high-quality set of traditional active strategies, uh, sub-advised by Wellington and by Schroeder's. Uh, these are high active share strategies. They're definitely not uh, benchmark hugging, closet index strategies. So it's really an opportunity to add value through through deep uh, a deep research based approach. Uh, the two firms take um, our approach is systematic, and it's important to distinguish. While it's systematic, and there's an index that's used to actually form the portfolio that, that uh, underlies the ETF. These are active strategies in the sense that if you were to look at the portfolio characteristics they're going to look quite different than the market cap portfolio. We're just getting to that, uh, that actual portfolio exposure through, again, systematic means, means where you have a very transparent view as an investor into what are you, what are you basing the decisions on that form the portfolio and where you can be assured that there's consistency uh, in those exposures over time. We have about two minutes left here. I want to come back to something Connor was touching on uh, earlier. Obviously, U.S. stocks have really been the only game in town this year. Uh, you know, they've significantly outperformed international stocks if you go back over the past nine plus years since the financial crisis. So if we were just to boil this down, what's the case for international stocks moving forward? Uh, you know, certainly it's been a, a tough comparison relative to U.S. stocks. And if you look at uh, certainly underlying fundamentals, uh, U.S. profit growth this year, um, Clearly, a little turbo boost from the from the tax cut that won't be repeat, repeatable next year. But with S and P earnings uh, growing at growing north of twenty percent and profit margins, corporate profit margins at at or close to all time highs, you've had terrific fundamentals, and obviously we've had great economic strength here. Um, the other side of that is when you have great fundamentals, uh, great growth, great profit margins, valuations tend to price that. And the, really the case for investing outside of the U.S. for additional diversification and seeking uh, perhaps improved returns looking forward over the next 10 years is that valuation, generally speaking, is meaningfully uh, improved outside of the U.S., and that varies across markets. So we do believe that uh, certainly uh, starting price matters to future returns. But then secondly, and I, I think no less importantly, Fundamentals outside of the U.S., this is why stocks outside the U.S. underperformed, um, have room for upside improvement. You could make a case that in the U.S. it's, well, it's going to be hard for uh, the S&P, for large-cap U.S. companies, to compound earnings growth at 20%. That's just not historically something we've ever seen for a sustained period of time. And while profit margins, I don't think, are due for a catastrophic collapse, I think there's very little room for upside improvement. And you can really say uh, the inverse is true outside of the U.S. There is an opportunity uh, for both earnings growth to improve as well as, uh, as, well as profit margins. Um, and with a, a more attractive uh, entry valuation, I think kind of a double barrel effect there. Obviously, you also have, from a macro perspective, uh, a more accommodative um, environment outside of the U.S. Clearly, the, the Fed is on the vanguard, if you will, um, in terms of uh, tightening both through uh, through uh, rate hikes as well as uh, now quantitative tightening and withdrawal of some of the liquidity we've had. Well, Ted, with that, we're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much for joining us. Great to be with you, Nate. Thank you. That was Ted Lucas, Head of Investment Strategies and Solutions for Hartford Funds. And you can learn more about their ETF lineup by visiting hartfordfunds.com. One thing I'll add to that is, and we've covered this the past couple of weeks on the show, because of the relative outperformance of U.S. stocks, sometimes it can be hard to look at other uh, areas of the globe and see that underperformance and stay allocated to that. But if you're going to have a a well-diversified portfolio, that's part of the deal. And if you look back over the past 15, 16 years, about half of those times, Emerging market stocks have been one of the top two performing asset classes and, you know, developed markets, uh, developed international markets haven't been far behind in in many of those years. So I I just think really important to keep in mind, given the type of of market environment we've had. Podcasts of ETF Prime are available at ETFprime.com, ETF.com, iTunes and Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter at Nate Geraci and at C. Kelly 1980. Next week, we'll be joined by Heather Brownlee. U.S. head of iShares Fixed Income. 
As it turns out, the iShares Core U.S. Aggregate Bond ETF, which was the first broad bond market ETF ever, it recently celebrated its 15-year anniversary. So we'll discuss with Heather how that ETF revolutionized bond investing and just how ETFs overall have continued to revolutionize bond investing. Should be a good show. Until then, have a great week, everyone.